Good evening, uh, everyone. Welcome to the first uh, USOMI webinar of the year. Gennaro Danna speaking from Italy. First of all, thank Bracco for uh, supporting us. Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the co moderator, Meryl Lewisman from Belgium. So, Meryl. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm from the Netherlands, but you know, it's close. <laughs> so, um, uh, I'm a resident from the Netherlands, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, Dr. Uh, Alexander Keritsis. He is an uh, MR physicist and data analyst at the radiology department of the University Hospital of Zurich. And there he is responsible for the development of deep learning algorithms for medical imaging processing, especially in the field of mammography. Uh, Alexander Karitsis is also co-founder and CTO of the University Hospital spin-off B Ray Z. So um, during the, the lecture that will approximately last uh, 30 minutes, uh, we can uh, um, the attendees can uh, write questions in the uh, the Q and A box below. So please not the chat box. So it's the second uh, box from the left ne next to participants. And as we are uh, quite a small group as of now, I think we can have a nice interactive uh, uh, lecture. So after the uh, lecture finishes, we still have some time for a discussion. So please stay tuned and uh, don't hesitate to uh, pose any questions. So uh, now you, uh, Alexander Gritsis, the floor is yours. You can start. Okay. Yes. Uh, good evening all together. Thank you for the uh, nice introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to have this talk uh, with all you together in this uh, small lecture. Um, yes, as I was introduced, this is everything is correct. I'm uh, working currently at the University Hospital in Zurich in the radiology department and there my background is actually an MR, an MR physicist but uh, over the years it developed more and more into the field of AI, which is, uh, yeah, which needs to be done actually. It's such a big topic and it uh, uh, matters to all of us. And of course it's a, it's a really interesting field. And there especially uh, I focus on the AI for mammographic uh, tools and AI based applications in breast imaging. So, the talk today uh, and the webinar today I want to, uh, to talk about is how to bring an AI-based application from the product idea to the development into the CE mark to make it really um, producible and doable product, which is also uh, legible for market entry. So with that, I want to start. In our um, project, uh, we started with a pilot study, of course, where we tested the potential of our study. For that, we bought in the beginning, in I think it was 2016 when we started that, we bought a commercially industry software from VB, which is basically made to, um, to trigger or to find um, production errors like in watches or in textile industry. So there's a textile industry and this uh, software is fed with all the images from there and it uh, classifies all the bad man-made textiles, classifies them and can sort them automatically out. The same for watches as you can see here, for example, the two, three, there's a production error and also here in this textile there's an error. So we thought, okay, when this is possible to find errors in textile or in, in watches, why shouldn't it be able to find errors in tissue, like for example, lesions? So we fed this software with a lot of uh, breast imaging data we had from our mammography department or from our radiology department and set up a study where we had a lot of mammographies with, mal with malignant and benign uh, lesions. There we excluded some, uh, we did some different groups here and uh, defined our training and, and, and validation set and everything and uh, came up, sorry, and came up with this study cohort where we had actually, as you can see here, quite a small number only of uh, lesions, but for that software, particular software, it was enough. Why was it enough? Because the software from VD makes an uh, artificial uh, augmentation of the data and you produce much more data than you originally had and the data is augmented by shifting it, turning it and uh, uh, flipping it and all that stuff. 
and afterwards you have much more data in, on which the uh, neural network can learn and uh, we came up with some pretty good results which i can show you here this was the the mammography which, which run over the uh, which we run over the software of the vd patient of the vd software so we had here 46 year old patient with an invasive ductal breast cancer and um, this was found by the software and here we had our rock curves for that and we saw that the neural networks only with this software which is like a black box where you only feed in the images you don't know what uh, what is uh, what is done there already had comparable results as experienced radiologists and uh, that radiologists typically exhibit lower sensitivity but however higher specificity so this is not a secret but we were quite uh, astonished by this approach that we just could feed any black box model and any black box software which was originally made for something totally different with a set of images from our mammography department and uh, could achieve good results. This was uh, actually published in Investigative Radiology then in 2017 and had a quite big echo and was cited quite a lot this, uh, this paper. And from there we thought, okay, why should we keep it with this potential and why should we keep it with this pilot study? We want to understand what the neural network uh, learns and what it uh, what the features are. So we have to build it by ourselves. So we have to to build up the whole architecture by ourselves and build the whole software by ourselves. So this was the initial starting point of our project where we wanted to um, develop AI-based applications for breast imaging. And we thought at the beginning, so what is, what is a good use case to have AI in mammography? And uh, of course, everyone and, and a lot of other companies go for this cancer thing and the lesions and microcalcifications and all that stuff. But in our belief, we have to start earlier. And one big uh, uh, and important step in the mammography workflow is the classification of the density. The density is a really, really important issue when it comes to mammography as women with higher, uh, uh, higher dense breast tissue tend to have a higher um, uh, have, uh, it's more likely for them to develop cancer in their lifetime. So the breast density actually can be um, defined like this. You can see here that you have in a normal mammography, you have fatty tissue and you have the, the parenchyma and the more parenchyma you have, the more dense the breast is and that means that, the, uh, that you have a higher risk to develop first of all breast cancer and also another problem with a high dense breast is that potential lesions can be missed due to this high density. And this density is classified by the doctors not in a, in a, um, a quantitative way but in a qualitative way. So every doctor and every radiologist has his own mindset of how dense breasts should look like or should not look like and classifies them according to the American College of Radiology catalog and this is classified, the breasts are classified in ACRA, B, C and D. So this is basically what I have told before that you have women with a high breast density have two to six fold increased risk of developing uh, breast cancer. And for death brands, the sensitivity of screening mammography drops from 87 to 63%. So usually patients with a high breast density require an additional imaging such as the tomosynthesis and ultrasound and uh, automatic breast ultrasound, breast MR, or even best CT, which is now a new modality to increase the cancer detection chances. And in our department, the workflow goes like this, that the, um, the technician um, acquires the images of the patient, and then we have an automatic breast ultrasound. She or he, the technician, can um, decide by her own, or should decide by her own or her own, if a uh, further modality like ultrasound is necessary or not. But in real time, this doesn't work like this or in the real world, and I will come to that later. 
So here again are the numbers. You can see that you have a decrease in sensitivity uh, for for dense breasts when you go for the for the viral scatter for the ACR, and that you have an increased uh, cancer risk, of course, also when there is a dense breast. So we thought this is a good idea to start from to, to develop an algorithm which classifies the depth, uh, the density and the breast density. As you can see here, here are now four typical images, which are um, for the four uh, different uh, density types. And you have here on the left side, you have the density A, here you have the density B, C, and D. But as you already can see, this uh, bears a lot of discussion. Um, some doctor would say that this is maybe the B breast is a C dense breast and the other way around. Or maybe somebody would say the D dense breast is a C dense breast because Every doctor has a different picture of that and I, um, um, defines it in a little bit different way. So you have a high, a really high interreader disagreement. And what is clear is that for type A, you have a fatty breast, which is almost entirely of fat. Type B, you have scattered fibroangular and uh, some scattered areas of, um, of parenchymal tissue. And in the type C, you have a heterogeneously dense breast um, and which is heterogeneously dense. Type D, of course, is a dense breast and which is extremely dense. In our department, we do a further modality um, either when it's a C dense breast or a D dense breast. So there, C or D, we do an ultrasound. So this, we thought, is a good, good way to uh, implement a simple or first simple model, maybe, for an AI. Because, as we, I said before, there's a high interreader disagreement, first of all. And second of all, this seems to need, there's a need for standardization. And this is, uh, in, in my opinion, a big part and a big role which AI can take to help standardize procedures in imaging which are or even uh, reporting, which are not standardized yet. The problem is you could do this in a, quanti uh, in a, in a quantified way, but the literature or the ACR catalog is based on visual, um, on visual depiction. So it's really the, um, the experience of the radiologist, which is important here and not to quantify, to count pixels. Other uh, software do that. For example, computer-aided uh, uh, diagnosis does it in, in that way that it quantifies more or less the pixels. But the problem is when you have, for example, here a spot where you have a really dense um, area, you still would classify that as a high densely dense breast as you don't know what's behind that dense area. But when you just count pixels or do it in a quantified way, then you would have more uh, fatty tissue than uh, parenchymal and it would be classified as a breast density A or B breast. So in the recent revised uh, Bywitz catalog of 2013, as I said before, the classification is, according, uh, is uh, carried out according to the descriptive density. And this also, as I said before, um, delivers a bad reproducibility and you will have to do a reclassification of 12.6 to 18.7 percent of the mammographic densities in the re-evaluation. So quantitative techniques are not helpful because they are using a different standard. So again, these are really strong points in order to have an AI algorithm evaluating that and acting more or less like a radiologist and determining it like a radiologist because it's trained on the data from a radiologist or from a, from a set of radiologists. So we thought the solution of the problem is, of course, an artificial intelligence. And uh, there, when you go for um, classification of images, you usually go for deep convolution neural networks. We set up an image. This is uh, in a network. This here is just a small um, or um, um, a scheme of our network we, we implemented. We had some input images, of course. We scaled them down because the DICOMs and especially best images have quite high resolution. So we needed to scale them down. Otherwise, the computer power wouldn't be sufficient enough. And then we had uh, 13 layers. Uh, 13 hidden layers and went out with an output of four for each class one, of course, A, B, C, and D. 
we uh, trained it with the expertise of the whole radiologist team. So we had a quite high training data set uh, going back four or five years in our institute. And there we could sample 20,578 training or validation cases from 5,221 patients. Um, this was a really good data set and this again is a big uh, a, a really good thing of the mammography because the mammography is a really already standardized imaging modality. So it is quite obvious and quite easy to implement their machine learning or AI algorithms on, or deep convolutional neural networks because you have such a standardized imaging modality where you don't have such a high variance in your data. And even if you have images from different vendors, this doesn't matter too much because the procedure of the imaging is always the same. It always is uh, compressed and the doses are more or less the same. And the, the systematic behind the whole mammography imaging is from, doesn't, uh, isn't different from vendor to vendor. So here were our first results then. We were able to, to come up with some really good algorithms. We uh, achieved here a training accuracy of over 90% of, oh, sorry, sorry, of over 90% and also in, uh, validation accuracy for the mediolateral oblique projections and also for the Kanya caudal projections, we uh, received uh, quite high uh, accuracies. On the right side here, you can see how the neural networks classified those different uh, breasts. So this was clearly for the neural network uh, ACRD breast. Here we have a C breast, and this was classified as a B. We stopped then, of course, our training in order to avoid overfitting. This we stopped at 91 epochs, and, um, and for the CC we stopped it at 94 epochs and we came up with some good uh, validation and training accuracies and also on the test data sets we had accuracies of 93 uh, percent for both. This is then where it became interesting and when we said okay this is now a nice a nice application and how could we provide this application to the public. Of course we, we wrote our, our um, papers and, and Send it into the journals and it was accepted. This one here was accepted at the British Journal for Radiology. But uh, we wanted to do more with that because we thought this is a really good application and there's a need for that. So in 2018, we came up with the idea to uh, form a company called B Rays where we, where we could deliver all those products and this and solution. So we did um, a spin off company with the University Hospital of Zurich and um, in our first attempt we tried to provide this algorithms via the internet so that the departments and the radiology departments were able to upload their image on the dedicated server without their patient information of course and anonymized and then, the and then on the server the algorithm was running and gave back the result. But we saw that this is just a nice thing to have, uh, this uh, uh, putting it up to the internet, but it doesn't help in the workflow. What we really wanted to do is helping to improve the workflow in a radiological department. So we came up with the idea of the V-Box. And this is uh, the first product we developed there with our AI applications for mammography. And this, as you can see here, is the normal workflow how it is done at the university hospital in Zurich. So the patient comes and does a, gets the mammography. And after that, there's a quality check, of course, of the mammography. I'll come to that later. And there's um, um, reconciliation with the, with the radiologist. And maybe sometimes he is available right at the moment, and sometimes he's somewhere else, but the technician has to call him or her and ask, is the image okay? Do I have to do a further ultrasound? Because I'm not sure what the breast density is. And uh, please tell me, can I send the patient home or does she have to wait in order to get a further sonography? And this 20 to 30 minutes here is too long for the patient and is also bad for the efficiency of the, of the department. So our product or our algorithm cuts into this niche and we put this uh, small computer here, this B-Box, so this is actually a bigger one because it was our prototype. Now it's much smaller with a touch screen on it and the 
technician is able to see in real life and in real time what the uh, classified density is and can decide by her own if she wants to do a further sonography, if she wants to send the patient to the sonography or does it by herself even, and so she does it by herself, or if the patient can go home. And this only takes like 30 seconds and there's no reconciliation with uh, radiologists necessary. Besides that, that it is also um, much more efficient, it also is de-emotionalizing the whole process. Because maybe some of you know that if, if here the technician has to tell the radiologist and then the technician says, yeah, I think it's best density C, no, I think it's best density D or A. So there is a discussion here always going on between those two. And here, the, the decision is just overtaken by the AI. And again, this decision is a really soft decision. It's not a hard decision. We don't decide you have a Byrates 4 lesion or a Byrates 5 lesion, or you have a D9 or malignant microcalcification. It's just, do you get a further ultrasound, yes or no? So this is now our beatbox, which is at the, this is the prototype running at the in the clinical routine of the University Hospital in Zurich. You can see here the direct feedback. We give the percentages of the classification for the different breast densities. There's the overall density of the whole uh, uh, patient, and then you could also access the the different breast densities for each projection so for the mlo uh, lmlo rmlo lmlo and rcc and lcc and uh, we published it when we had the 96 to 99 percent accuracy for ultrasound recommendation based on this um, based on the results here from the d box and the final product was then trained with more than 60,000 mammographies and they were all annotated by radiologists of the University Hospital in Zurich or different radiologists. So this box or this algorithm combines like the collected breast density wisdom, so to speak, of the University Hospital Zurich. The good thing is it works on each clinical site. So, um, you can install this box as a plug and play solution. And also this is a big advantage as we see it right now, that we don't send images to the cloud. We don't do a cloud service, we could do it, but we don't do it. The images stay at the university hospital and uh, are processed there. We don't have access to that data and all the data, patient data and everything is processed at the university hospital, it never leaves the, the place there. And this is a big uh, issue for many uh, hospitals that their data, if they want to use AI, they have to send it to some clouds which are somewhere in the world. And from regulatory terms and uh, law terms, this is not that easy. Also, it gives a real time feedback. So, with that, the idea came before that, but this was then the, the end idea. Let's transfer it into a startup and sell it as a medical product. And there actually comes the difficult part. The easy part and the fun part is the development of the AI algorithm and the, the, the tuning of the parameters and the labeling and the annotation also can be quite fun and how to, to, to augment the data and all that stuff. But transferring your project idea to a medical product is hard work and not much fun if you are into science and research. Besides the density, this I just want to say, we also came up with a different product. So here again, you have the density, but what we also did is that we um, evaluated the quality of the mammography. So we trained another algorithm with many, many models in it. And as every mammography has to be uh, acquired in a certain quality, um, otherwise it's not legible. Um, we thought also that this is also a really good application because again, there, uh, there's a big need for standardization. So for example, the um, technician has always to depict the inframammary fall, which is down here. Also, she always, in the mammography image, also the nipple always has to be hit in the profile. The parenchyma always has to be fully depicted. This angle has to be a certain degree. This angle has to be in between 20 and 30 degrees. Here on the CC projection, also the nipple has to be in the right 
uh, in the profile and so on and so on. And after that, with, with that application, the, uh, the technician first knows about the density, of course, and then also gets the results of the quality of her images and can, first of all, see what she or he did wrong or did right, and if she has to redo the, um, the imaging, because the image is, from the quality-wise, too bad in order to, um, to make a report out of it. And this is, in my opinion, also um, a big issue because it doesn't make sense to go for cancer detection AI algorithms or something like that before you even don't know if the image has the right quality in order to do cancer detection. So this step is often missed out and this is often the bottleneck. You have two bad data and you do your cancer detection on bad data, which is not even uh, where all the, the parenchyma, for example, is not fully depicted. So this was the other idea. And then in the third module, we give the statistics of the technician and we collect it. So every technician has her own, sorry, her own statistic and can see what he or she did wrong, what she has to do better the next time and so on. And again, this whole quality control also de-emotionalizes the whole process between the technician and the doctor. So what do you need at first when you, when you uh, want to do a startup and when, when you want to transfer your idea into a medical product? First of all, of course, there's always the name. I don't know if our name is that cool. We thought of B for breast, Ray for, of course, because we do, we do it somehow with X-ray and the Z is for Zurich. And this name you have to protect somehow. Here's the, the Swiss side for it to, uh, to protect your, your name and your corporation your corporation. So this is the first thing maybe you will do when you go for a product and start up with your AI application. But this is the fun part still. Then you have to uh, somehow save or have an agreement on your intellectual property rights, so the so-called IP agreement. In Zurich, there are some, some rules for that, and we had uh, a lot of talks and, and discussions with the University Hospital in Zurich and with the UNITECTRA in order to get the IP agreement. So what is our intellectual property and what belongs to the University Hospital because of, uh, it was also developed during our working times while we were employed there. So you need an agree agreement with your University Hospital or with your institution in order to go further. Otherwise, you don't have nothing, and so you have to agree on that too. And this IP agreement is always a matter of negotiation, of course. So first of all, there are some good things for the institution also. You have some compensation for the taxpayer. The institution can sell it as a success story. It benefits from the innovation. It can generate, of course, revenues to further projects, and it uh, can support employees. And for you, of course, it's also important and really uh, metaphor because you have freedom to you uh, in, in the IP, you have a success story again and uh, some form of benefit from the risk you, uh, you did. And this IP agreement always ends up in either royalties on your product or on the net cash flow on equity in the company. And this, again, is a little bit of negotiation between, between you and the company. Here I sent out, I, I just cut it and paste the collaboration agreement we got with the University Hospital in Zurich and our b race information at that time point. Now we are already for um, uh, an old company, but this was quite a long way of negotiation to get a good IP agreement there. And I, if you want to go that path someday, uh, don't underestimate it. It takes a long time, especially as institutions and, and federal institutions are quite slow in this kind of stuff. Then, of course, you have to make a business plan. So this is obvious. There you have to talk about your vision, your problem, the market potential, the products you want to develop. So you have to, to, to scale it. Your product has to be scalable. You have to introduce your team, your company profile. You have to 
come up with a marketing strategy. You have to do what is your competitive advantage and to have, of course, also a kind of a financial plan. So what are your expected expenses and revenues, including the break even, in order to know how much funding you will need. Because with this business plan and all those ideas, you will go out maybe at some day. I, if you don't are uh, really, really rich, you will go out and will try to find some money from investors in order to scale your product and come where you want to go. Again, marketing plan, also really important. Um, you have to uh, determine some attributes, how you do improve your workflow. You can, co uh, you can save costs there. You can think of the coolness of your product. If it, is it easy to use, the re reliability, and so on. So also, besides the business plan, the marketing plan, of course, is also important. Then you have to think, and this is always a, a little bit difficult, is it possible to patent your software? And we didn't patent our software, I can tell you. And we didn't patent it because of some uh, logical ways, because it's, in my opinion, it doesn't make sense to patent the software. Um, everyone, the software is not, the AI algorithm behind that is fun and is, is good and it's working fine, but the magic behind it is the data and the annotated data. So, and if I patent my software code or something like that, which is even really hard to do, it's really easy to, to um, go over this pattern just if you write some lines of code a little bit differently and then you are not even, uh, you don't have any legal issues. So patent, if you have like a hardware you're producing, yes, go for it for software. I wouldn't recommend to do a patent because it's easy to avoid for others to do the same as long as they have the same data. You must protect your IP and your data, but the patent, I wouldn't go for that. In the patent, you have to define what is your product doing and so on, and who has rights on the patent and all that stuff. But for software, I wouldn't recommend it, and we didn't do it. And now it gets a little bit annoying because this now for the, for the product, because this is now the important thing. This is the CE market. You don't have a product as long as you don't have a CE market. And there are different medical products and different classification for your CE mark. So first of all, you have to think of what type of medical product did you produce? Medical products, as I said before, need a CE mark and um, using or selling a medical product without a CE mark in any how is illegal. If you're, is, then you have to ask yourself, is your uh, product a medical device? First of all, maybe it is not a medical device. For example, a uh, PAX system is not a medical device. Yeah? A risk system or um, uh, a patient information system, also not a medical device. So you have to, to really go into the norm and think of it and, and uh, see the definitions if your product or your AI algorithms or what you want to do with your AI is a medical device. And if it is a medical device, you have to ask yourself and look up what risk classification it is. I will come to that. And what is the intended use? Right now, we are still in the medical device directive. So this is the old law, which was, uh, which was legal until from 1993 until now. There will be a change in 2020, May 2020, I think. And the MDD, the medical device directive, will be uh, supplemented by the MDR, the medical device regulations. I will come to that also in a little bit later, but this, our classification here now, the process is more or less the same for both directives. There are some crucial, but there is one or two crucial uh, differences, but more or less the process is the same. So you have to go into the medical device directive and read all through that in order to know if your product is a medical, medical device, this is defined there, and also which, uh, as said here before, what risk classification it is. So, first of all, there are some general requirements here. You have to uh, go through them all, all, all through. And here you see that the, the solutions 
adopted by the manufacturer for the design and construction of the devices must conform to safety principles taking into account of the generally acknowledged state of the art. So you need to document everything. This is actually what is said there. And here you come to the classification there, rule one of Annex one, I think it is, uh, comes into play and it says that all non-invasive devices are in class one, unless one of the rules set out hereafter applies. And these are the rules which apply hereafter. And if they are intended to supply energy and so on, which shall be absorbed. So you have to read all this and then it is you can know is it class one or is it class two A, for example. The good thing about a dead medical device of class one is that you can get, that you don't need a notified body in order to get your CE mark. You can give the CE mark to yourself, and you don't need a quality management system. As soon as you go for a class two, either two A or two B, you will need a notified body first of all who certifies you. And for that, you will need a quality management system, which also certifies your company as being legible to produce medical devices. Um, so if you are intended to use to, to image in vivo distribution of radio pharmaceuticals, you go to uh, 2A. Uh, if you are intended to supply energy, you go into A. And here, this is the important thing. If, you are intended to allow direct diagnosis or monitoring of vital physical processes, and it's their specific intent of monitoring and so on, you're going to be. And all active devices intended to administer and or remove medicines to the body are 2A, unless this is done in a manner that is potentially hazardous or taking into account of the nature. Or nature of substances involved, then you go again into class 2B. So you have to, uh, to read this precisely through and uh, think of in which classification you fall into. And again, the classification you fall into is determined by your, sorry, intended use. And the intended use you define. So when you say, my, for example, our system, our system is, in, uh, is for doing a second opinion and uh, replacing the doctor, then you have a different intended use when you say it's a educational tool for the technician in order to learn how density and quality in the mammography works. The intended use is defined by you and the uh, uh, medical device classification class is defined by the medic intended use. So, as said before, from uh, June 2020, the, med the MDD is gone and you will have to go for the MDR. And there, this is the rule 11 here in the MDR, which makes a big headache to all manufacturers of medical software. Because software intended to provide information which is used to take decisions with diagnosis or therapeutic purposes is classified as 2A, okay? except if such decisions have an impact that may cause death or invisible deterioration of a person's state of health. This is a really broad definition. And this means that many, a lot of software, which is now classified as a 2A device, or maybe even as a 1 device under the MDD, will now be reclassified into class 3. And the class three device is from regulatory uh, uh, point of view, really complicated and cumbersome to get through it. Here again are the differences from MDD according to MDR. So an app support, for example, a product supporting the selection uh, and dose calculation of systemic drugs was in, under MDD one, now goes under three. Standalone software application to support drug delivery one, will now be 2B or higher. Diagnose based on test results, one, 2B, or maybe even three. App to diagnose sleep apnea, one, or now 2A or higher. So everything will be classified higher, which will have a much higher regulatory burden for the companies right now. This is what I said before. At the moment, when you go for a high class uh, medical device, so class two or even class three, class two A, two B or three, you will need a notified body. 
and you will uh, need to establish a quality management system. And the notified body will check if your company has established a quality management system in order to produce um, uh, and manufacture a software with a certain quality standard in the EU for the European Union. And there again, it is the old saying, and this also comes to documentation for medical device. As um, Deming said, in God we trust, but all others have to bring data. And this is the same for documentation. You have to bring the data, you have to document your product, and you have to, to, to verify that it's working correctly, that you evaluate it in a, cl a clinical environment, that you tested it, that you did unit tests, integration tests, system tests of your software, and also, of course, the validation. For that quality management system, which you need to set up, the ISO uh, 13485 is the crucial uh, standard and uh, norm which you have to follow. This is the medical device quality management system requirements for regulatory purposes. In this standard, everything is written down and actually every um, header of the standard is one part of your quality management system. So for example, you will have here design and development, so you need to do a design and development planning, you need to do processes for inputs, outputs, how do you do reviews, how do you do the verification of the design and development, how do you do the validation, how do you do the uh, transfer of your design and development into the product, um, and this also all has to be documented again in design and development files, of course. Then it goes further, you need some process for purchasing, so how do you purchase, you need some um, um, process for uh, how do you do non conform how do you handle non conforming products how do you um, uh, provide services and maintenance of your product and so on so actually every header here is one process more or less and these are some processes when we saw that, we of course had to re-engineer our software because as it is usual, you don't start with a quality management system, you start with your software, you have developed your software and then you say, oh, okay, now I have to re-engineer everything. This is now a small exception, exception of, our, of our quality management system. We have all those processes here defined and uh, we are working uh, in this uh, quality management system which we set up by ourselves and this took much more time than the development of the product here is then such a document we generate here we have a quality management manual for example which needs to create a reviewer and an approver and there we structure the quality management manual accordingly again th this is how it looks our document control just to show you that you really need to produce a lot of data there I have the software development then follows another uh, rule and this follows the EC 62304 and this defines how you have to develop your software. I can skip that actually because I see we are a little bit running a little bit out of time. Um, in the 6304, you have to define how the usability is, what the safety classification of your product is, how you do the risk management, how you go, you have a life cycle model, how do you do that, and how do you implement soup? Soups is software of unknown providence, so software you use in order to, to produce your software. Yeah, I can skip that. Or maybe this I can talk a little bit. Here you have the typical risk assessment also. What you can see is you have to, you have to um, define the risk which may come up with your software. And you can uh, do this in such a matrix. And there you can say a risk is, you either define, the, you have to define the probability of the risk and the severity of the risk. And when it, when it is a frequent uh, upcoming uh, problem, which has a moderate risk, you are in this area here. So you have to deal with this product and have to mitigate that risk either by saying, yeah, okay, it's not that big, so it's only marginal, but this is uh, not likely when you first define it as a moderate risk from its severity wise. Uh, so you have to develop your software accordingly that the probability of the risk occurring is only unlikely, and then you would be in this field here, and then you would have mitigated your risk. 
This is then such a risk analysis table where you analyze each risk of your product. This is our risk analysis table actually, where you analyze each risk of the product and define it and put it in such a matrix here. So right now we have eight fully working tested and implemented mammography models. We have a CE mark waiting for us, which we will get in May. We will go for a class 2A there. We have implemented our quality management system right now and uh, are waiting for the CE mark from the notified body. And we have more models in progress for microcalcification, lesion detection, and so on. And of course, we did some publications on our work which you can find at PubMed, for example, also. And this is just also, again, a small, uh, small description of what we did in our QM system. And after all, we wrote 498 documents for the quality management, had 16 Excel sheets, three internal audits, management reviews, and external audits. So don't underestimate this work. It's much more work than the, than the development. Thank you. Okay, are the questions now? Um, Thank you, uh, Alexander, for Thank your- Thank you, activity. Alexander. Oh, so, uh, sorry, <laughs> Mara. It's okay, I'm trying to, oh, I have troubles here opening the Q&A box, so maybe you could assist. Okay, so we can start with the, the first one uh, question uh, no. by Oliver Diaz. Do you need uh, some any external certification to test uh, your prototype in your hospital? Perhaps uh, you pass some type of uh, internal ethical committee? Um, perhaps you pass some type of internal ethical. Yeah, so we, we have an ethical approval, of course. But uh, we tested also our, um, our product in other hospitals. For example, in Basel, we tested it. We had a, we had a cooperation, we still have a cooperation agreement with the University Hospital of Basel. And uh, the last part, I don't understand, perhaps you passed some type of internal eth ethical committee. Um, so we needed to do this. Uh, validation of the whole uh, software in also in other clinical sites because this is part of the clinical evaluation and the clinical evaluation of your software is a big part of the CE certification. So you need to provide this clinical evaluation in order to get a CE mark. And there are two ways to get this clinical evaluation done. Either you do it by yourself, set up a study and, and do it like we did, and you can additionally go for a literature, literature research and show that others did also the same and that it was safe and that it worked. So when you're developing a, a new Da Vinci, you, don't, you can say, yeah, we don't need to prove that it's working because Siemens showed it already with Da Vinci that it's working. Okay. Was this, uh, did this answer the question? I'm not sure. So, Meryl, do you want uh, the second one? Yes. Which one is this? Also from Oliver Diaz, a more technical question. If ACR breast density classification is so subjective, how did you create the ground truth data to measure the performance higher than radiologists? Yeah, um, that's true. The ground truth data for our test data set was done on, um, on a quite big test data set and it was in consensus. So two radiologists independently and then later in consensus talked about the images and we, no, it was more, it was three, three radiologists, experienced radiologists in breast imaging did a consensus decision and this was our ground truth. But yes, the question is right. This is highly subjective, but you ha this was, in our opinion, the best ground truth we could get to have a consensus decision of three radiologists who are experienced in that field. And so, again, it's not that important to be, of course, it's important to be right, but the, 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 the main part of the software is to have 
to give a result in a standardized way, which always performs in the same way. And not if the doctor is experienced or not, or not if it's five o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock in the evening, the doctor maybe has a different decision on the breast density because he or she doesn't want to do the extra ultrasound. So the, the software gives their standardized decision, which may be sometimes, of course, wrong in, according to another radiologist, but it's a standardized one. And this is the important uh, thing. So we have uh, another very interesting question uh, of Monif Eid. Uh, he is he or she, I'm sorry, is asking about um, which is more efficient, getting CE yeah. approval or, or yeah. FDA approval for AI, and could you elaborate on the differences? So first of all, CE approval is for Europe, and FDA is uh, for for the US or for I think for Canada also. So. This is, first of all, of course, uh, the big difference. Um, I think if you have a CE approval, if you did all your work for CE, it's much easier to get an FDA with this uh, because you did all, most of the work. And the, the good thing of the FDA is that it's really guided. You, you, there are really good guidelines and it's exactly written down what you have to write, how you have to write it, um, how many documents do have to, you have to produce, how the documents should look like, and so on. So the, the, the pathway for the FDA is much clearer defined, and there are not so many open questions. The CE, however, is quite um, difficult written, and it's in many, many different norms. Um, you have to read through, and then there are some advisors, but those don't apply all the time, so it's much more complicated to go through it. Um, so in my opinion, FDA is easier to get, but to be honest, if you are from Europe and, and you are developing your product in Europe, the first market you want to tackle is of course your home market, and this is probably a European market. So you should go for a CE first before you go for an FDA. Perfect. Okay. So does the audience have any other questions? Uh, if you do, please uh, type them in the Q&A box. Um, there is another question from uh, Monif as well, mm -hmm. uh, asking about the success rate in screening by, uh, by your uh, AI tool. Mm -hmm. um, not sure if that, that really applies here or is done. So could you please tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so screening is, um, is um, I'm not sure how many people are now from Switzerland here, but screening in Switzerland is a little bit a complicated issue because Switzerland is, um, we have uh, in Switzerland there are cantone and every every canton has its own rules uh, for screening. So some, so Zurich, for example, Canton Zurich doesn't have a screening program. Uh, Canton Basel has a screening program. So this is uh, a first big uh, issue in Switzerland. It's not that easy to get in those uh, screening uh, programs for us. But of course, the software is actually made for screening because we, uh, you can produce a good qual image quality there with our quality product. And also the density needs to be reported in any screening report now, mm. and also the quality. Um, so again, it's not like a success rate, it's more, um, an improvement of the workflow. And there we have it running in Basel at the moment and we also will have a pilot study with Luzern who also has a screening program and they can, uh, they can explicitly to us and ask us if we can install our software there because they have a screening program and they think that there's a big need for it. Also a big other advantage is that you could have when you have a screening program and everyone runs through that software and you have the density, you can have like, um, um, the percentage of how the breast density among women in this country is due based on our software. And this is quite important to know because then you know how high, how many mammographies, you need, uh, how many ultrasounds you need and what the, maybe you can also say something on the incidence of breast cancer there. Okay, so so could you, uh, if we have, we I see we we have no more questions. Uh, yeah. I, I was wondering actually. So, uh, what would you think is the biggest benefit uh, in clinical practice then uh, from implementing your uh, ACR 
presidency tool. So how, how much time would that save or how many uh, false negatives could that prevent? Because we would be talking about preventing mm. false negatives by misclassifying presidency and then lowering sensitivity, I think, in the higher categories. Yes. Um, so time saving wise, um, we think that you are able to do or what we what we what we evaluated is um, you can do four to five more mammographies uh, uh, per day in our institute with that but this depends really we don't have so, so high numbers of mammographies doing in Zurich at the university hospital they go to private practices there but the more uh, mammographies you are doing, of course, in your institute, the higher uh, the, uh, the higher the efficiency will get uh, throughout of that. And uh, preventing false negatives, um, up to eight percent can be can be prevented by that. Uh, um, eight to, but this also depends on the country. So in um, in the canton, and so if you have eight to ten percent of. Uh, being needing a reclassification based on the density and otherwise something would have been missed. Okay, thank you so much for that. Gennaro, do you... Okay, here I am. So uh, yeah. we can, I can, I think uh, we can now conclude. Just hearing this, that, yes. Uh, this, uh, this webinar, that's uh, such an interesting webinar. Thank you to uh, all the attendees and our uh, sponsor, Bracco. See you in the next uh, webinar. Uh, you can follow our uh, website, uh, www.usomi.org and our social media channels. See you. Uh, goodbye to everyone. Thank you for having me and goodbye to everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.